Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me well. Uh, I'll be joining you remotely. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I am aware that the last talk in this hall was also about protocols. Uh, so if you haven't had the chance to listen to the previous talk, hopefully you'll get similar benefits from mine. So thank you, Rogier. Hope I said that right. And um, um, can I just get a confirmation that the sound's working from a, an operator so we can start? Okay, I'll assume that it works. Okay. So, a little bit about me. My name is Ron. I'm a data engineer at Bluevine. I enjoy learning about how programming languages work, uh, new features, and how I can use them better. I love traveling and hiking. I'm currently based out of California. So a little bit about Bluevine, it's a fintech company that provides online business banking and financing to small to medium-sized businesses. Um, we use Python everywhere. Uh, we have Django on a server side and use it for our data pipelines, data science, analytics, and machine learning. So what are protocols? Let's first talk about the existing definition. Um, so first of all, um, they were added in PEP 544, uh, aptly named Protocol Structural Subtyping. They're introduced for Python 3.8, and they are an extension of the typing system. So the term protocol is a widely understood construct in the Python community, which basically means an interface which requires the implementation of a Dunder method. So the iterator protocol implies the implementation of the iter and probably next Dunder methods. Um, the size protocol, for example, requires the implementation of the Dunder len method. So for example, if we want to create a class which implements the iterator and size protocols, we would do it by inheriting the abstract base classes size and iterator. Uh, an iterator is any object that it can be um, iterated upon, meaning it implements the Dunder iter and next method, and a size is any object with a known length. So aside from these type annotations that you see in this slide, there's this is nothing new. And before we continue to the new definition, let's give a little bit more context and talk about the typing system a little bit and what why it's important. So what is the typing system in Python? Um, type annotations make it easier to read, refactor, and validate code correctness statically. And what I mean by statically, it means that they do not get evaluated during runtime and evaluated only by static type checkers like MyPy. They also provide uh, great means for documentation in the code. So let's look at an example here. Um, here we define a class that registers callback functions to receive an integer as the sole argument and return a Boolean value. And on the second line, I defined a type alias, which basically specifies what what this type is. So in this case, it's a callable that can accept only an integer as an argument and returns a Boolean. This means that it can accept functions or sometimes even classes. So this provides better readability and to avoid repeating the long annotation. The callable annotation um, means that basically every object that implements the Dunder call method. So as I said, it's either a function or a class. And you can see here that the is even function matches the type hint we define, and then we can register it to an instance of the class. So with this little bit of typing annotations, we get a lot of clarity for our code. So this is kind of part of the strength for the typing system. So let's talk about the new definition for the protocols. Um, so they provide uh, the goal and the rationale of the PEP is to provide the static type checkers like MyPy and other tools the ability to verify code correctness prior to runtime. It enables the implementation of interfaces without explicitly inheriting from abstract-based classes. The PEP defines this behavior um, 
of inheriting from base classes as something that is unpythonic and unlike one would normally do in idiomatic dynamically typed Python code. That's a mouthful. So let's let's look at a comparison between the old definition and the next. Um, so let's simplify the example from before a little bit. This is how one would normally register as a class on the protocol. On the left side, we can see that we inherit the classes. And on the right side is the same code, which implicitly implements the protocols. For both cases, the code actually passes the type check, which is the new feature, really. And it is important to know that the goal is only to support this behavior statically, since abstract base classes already provide support for this during runtime. So before we continue, let's um, let's clarify the difference between the two forms So of subtyping. So first of all, we have the nominal subtyping, which is explicit, basically means that it's in the name. And one type is a subtype of another if and only if it explicitly is declared so to be in its definition, uh, which means that if we run the is instance method on it, it gets evaluated to be correct. A structural subtyping means that one type is a subtype of another if it behaves similarly to it. So basically, duck typing. So let's, to illustrate the difference, we'll create a doc protocol, which defines a bark method. And here we have Scooby-Doo, which is a dog. And since its parents class is a dog, and therefore it must have a bark method. So this is an example of a nominal subtyping, um, very classic behavior. However, according to structural subtyping, a eucalyptus tree is also a dog because it has a bark. Um, now, I've, obviously, this is a joke. And if you get it and it's kind of obscure, then you're probably in the, in the intersection of this Venn diagram. So obviously, what we want it is a supports bark protocol because trees are no dogs. Um, and in this case, both of these types are considered subclasses of the supports bar class. So finally, let's show how to create a new protocol. Protocols are defined by including a special new class called typing not protocol, or if you're using Python 3.7 or below, typing under underscore extensions is the module you would import it from. All it takes for a class to be a subtype of supports close is to implement a close method with an identical signature. And yes, this ellipses is a valid notation. It is the same as the pass keyword. So here we're implementing, we're actually using the supports close in a in the signature of a function, we define a function close all, which accepts uh, an argument named things, uh, which is of the type iterable supports close. And you can see how we use it below. We have an, we open a file and a resource, and we pass them all to close all, and you can see that it works. So the interesting thing here is that f is a built-in type, which can be accepted as an argument for close all without modifying the base class. This implicit subtyping prevented it from writing extra code to wrap it like so. So here we would have to, without protocols, if we wanted to enable the same the same type, we would have to write, wrap the, the file type within another class and then subtype the supports close class. This makes things a lot neater. Um, this, is, this is example specifically is very messy and verbose verbose and specifically this would be in my opinion the best use case for protocols so um, in order to turn a subclass into a protocol and to extend it you must inherit typing protocol otherwise it will be downgraded to a regular abstract base class so in this example if we want to create a new protocol which defines that you have to 
to find the Dunder len method and the close method, we would have to create a new class, inherit both of these protocols, and then inherit protocol again. There's actually nothing wrong with not inherit, inheriting protocol, but then it would just be a regular abstract base class, and that feature already exists. So um, just be aware when you do it. You can also create generic protocols, and you can do that by uh, using type vars and specified using the double brackets notation, the square brackets notation. So for example, um, the iterable protocol is a generic protocol that can accept a generic argument, and then we can define which type it accepts. So here's how you define that. You can actually use the special type var um, object from typing. Uh, you give it a sort of an alias, and then you can create your protocol uh, like so. You create the, the class, and then you inherit from protocol, and then you specify the generic protocol. And underneath, you can see that for the variable collection, we pass the an iterable of size and closable type. So let's get to a real world example that we actually uh, used in our day-to-day. -day. So executing a procedure on batches of data is something that we do a lot. Uh, the data usually changes somewhat between projects depending on the use cases, but I wanted to create a data batcher which can iterate over some abstract type so it can be easily reused. So here's an example of how it would be used. Here we're creating uh, three different collection objects, uh, which are quite different from each other. One of them is a list of integers, one of them is a string, and one of them is actually a data frame uh, from a third-party library, Pandas. And here we're creating three data batch generators for each one, and then we loop over all of them in a single loop, and we get the output below. So this is kind of what we want to achieve. And now obviously, all of these can be iterated in some in some form. However, if we iterate over them, we probably are not going to get what we expect. So we have to define a, this class which implements this behavior. And in order to define it, it needs to know which type to accept. So let's first start by defining our protocol. Let's start with the first part. So we want to iterate over these, all of these objects. And when we want to iterate over some object, you need to know, first of all, when to stop the iteration. And second, how to divide it into batches of equal size. So the first part is actually easy. We already know this protocol. It's called the size protocol. We just need to know the length of the data to know when we reach the end of it, which means it needs to implement the dunder len method. And we already have a, this built-in protocol for that, so that's out of our way. And the second part is a little more tricky since we want to achieve the following in order to batch the data. And this kind of looks like we're accessing the data using indexing. So let's create a supports index protocol. Here we're creating this protocol, which basically uh, states that you must implement the Dunder index method. However, there's a problem with that because a pandas data frame cannot be indexed unless you're using some other method, which is like the iLock method, like a regular collection. Okay, so let's try something else. Let's try the uh, Dunder get item method instead. So this would be a container protocol, but they kind of solved it. But now the type checker will allow a dictionary to be used since it can be accessed using the square brackets notation. Now, this is not too awful, but we want to be more precise about the types we can use. And also, we can't really iterate over dictionaries like we can other collections.
So as it turns out that this notation of i colon i plus n is actually a slice object. So our protocol should look something like this. And you can see that the item it accepts in the function is of type slice. And we're able to define this protocol with really great granularity up to the type of a method argument. And we can combine them both into one protocol, which is our final product. Uh, here, we created the support slicing size class, which inherits both from size support slicing and the protocol, which makes it a protocol. So now let's take a look at the final code. The So this is the final code. And you can see here, this is nothing really special. It's just um, some sort of um, batcher that well, let's, let's actually take a look at it a little bit. And the interesting part happens in the dunder next method. First of all, the first line actually uses the sized protocol, and we check the length of the data. And then a few lines afterward, we're actually batching it. And you can see here that the in the init method, the data argument is of type support slicing size. And this enables us to define quite a strict interfaces, which enables built-in and third-party library types to be used without changing them, and thereby greatly decoupling our code. Also notice how the data batch generator actually implements the iterator protocol and the iterable protocol, uh, which is pretty cool. So this means that this example, this code will now pass a type check because all of these types, without modifying them or anything or subclassing them, are now considered a subclass of our protocol. So thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Okay, we do have a few minutes if anyone does want to come up to the mic and ask a question. All right, then I guess that, oh, is that a question? Um, thanks for the talk. You showed that um, seems like the signature, at least the input of the methods are checked um, in the protocol. Is there a way to also have it for the output? As in, like, to check that the met, like, or if, if I have a property that the property is a list. You mean the return type of the yeah. function? Yeah. I, I believe that the type checker will check for that if possible. Um, yeah, I mean, also, I didn't mention that, but. I recommend reading the actual PEP because it provides a very uh, thorough explanation of the subject. Uh, but yes, function, arg function return types should be checked. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so you went with um, a lot of the protocols like sized and iterable. How do you go about um, going from very broad, uh, broad types like AR of a dictionary or mapping to I only need a um, lang method, so I only need sized um, for my particular function. Do you, do you uh, have any uh, good way to do that? Or if you, do you know what I mean? Um, actually, uh, can you try to explain a little bit more? I'm not yeah, sure so, I understand so the I question. So when I have a method, right, I, I want to give it um, I don't know, something, I usually give it a, a dictionary, um, but all it ever does is it, it only checks the length of um, the container or whatever is in there. Um, so actually my type for my argument is dictionary, but all I need is size. Um, do you have a good way about going from the very um, uh, rich definition of mapping or dictionary to sized? You know what I mean? Um, so, if, so if I understood that correctly, you want to specify more um, kind of low-level 
yeah. type in your in your function definition. Yeah. Uh, well, in that case, well, first of all, you know, you gotta under, you gotta check that your function really does need to uh, doesn't really care about the type other than the the function defined in the protocol. And if so, then you can just pass in in this case as instead of the dictionary uh, type annotation in the function argument, you can pass in the sized. Uh, yeah, sure. type no, annotation. If I, yeah, if I understand that, sure. But like, yeah, yeah, I guess there's no easy way to to go. Like, okay, a type checker could tell you, hey, actually, you're using this broad definition, like the the dictionary, but you only need a sized. But yeah, there's no oh. thing. I think I'm not familiar with anything like that. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's up to you. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Yep. Thank you so much.